great news. You don't have to listen to me after today. That'll be pretty good. So uh, this les lesson's going to be on compressible viscous fluids. It's going to be a mechanical theory for them. So we're not going to be talking about temperature or uh, heat flux or anything like that. And then the, uh, the last homework assignment, you basically have to add temperature dependence into today's discussion. So that won't change, for instance, the fact that the viscous stress is only going to be able to depend on the symmetric part of the velocity gradient. But your free energy and stuff will be functions of the density as well as the temperature. All right, so a compressible viscous fluid is, again, a homogeneous body, so it's the same throughout, governed by constitutive equations of the following form. Basically, what we're doing is we're adding viscosity to the uh, elastic fluids discussion. So the <clears throat> free energy is equal to the free energy of the density and the velocity gradient. And the Cauchy stress is equal to its constitutive response function of the same due to the principle of equipresence. <clears throat> so even though we don't expect that the specific free energy should depend on the velocity gradient, we're going to consider it anyway in light of the principle of equipresence, and then we're going to rule it out by way of the Coleman Null procedure. So the first thing that we'll use again is frame indifference, um, and then we'll use the second law of thermodynamics. So here we go. So we have that psi star is equal to psi hat of rho star and L star, which is equal to psi hat of rho, right, because the density does not change under change of frame. And then L star, if you look back to our discussion on frame indifference, that one transforms like Q L Q transpose plus Q dot Q transpose. Well, that needs to equal psi in the frame f because it's a scalar, so it has to be invariant. And that is equal to psi hat of rho and L. <clears throat> and then the Cauchy stress is going to go like this. T star is frame indifferent, so it's equal to Q T <laughs> Q transpose. So that's equal to T hat of rho Q L Q transpose plus Q dot Q transpose. And that is equal to Q T hat of rho and L Q transpose. All right, so we can kind of simplify those down to psi hat of rho and L is equal to psi hat of rho and that mess. <clears throat> <clears throat>
And then the Cauchy stress goes like this. All right, so these both have to hold for any arbitrary values of the density being greater than zero. The velocity gradient could be any second order tensor and Q can be any rotation. So that's orth plus is the <clears throat> space of rotation tensors. <clears throat> well, if this has to hold for all rotations Q, then in particular, it has to hold when Q is the identity. Um, so we could say that at time t naught, that q is equal to the identity. And um, q dot is independent from that in some way. Um, you know, it's constrained in that it has to look like a skew symmetric tensor times q. But, um, but we could pick any old skew symmetric tensor to define Q dot. So. <clears throat> so let's say Q of T satisfies Q of zero is equal to the identity and Q dot of zero is equal to omega naught Q for some fixed omega naught in skew v. All right, well then at time t equals zero, we can pretty much get rid of all of the q's in there and q dot q transpose, where you see that omega naught q q transpose, q transpose is q inverse. So this term here is just going to go to omega naught, and all the q's are just the identity. So what we end up with is, uh, let me copy it out of my notes lest I do it wrong. So we have that the specific free energy is going to look like psi hat of rho again. Um, and let's split up that L from here into its symmetric and skew symmetric parts. So D, the symmetric part, plus W, also known as the spin. The skew symmetric part and then plus omega naught. And then likewise, we have that the Cauchy stress, and remember that the Q's all went away because they were the identity. <clears throat> 
at time t equals 0 is equal to t hat of the same. <clears throat> All right, so this has to hold for any arbitrary choice of L, which means that D could be any symmetric tensor, and W could be any skew symmetric tensor, and then omega naught could be any skew symmetric tensor. So in particular, that has to hold for omega naught equals minus W. And so then what we have is that psi hat of rho and L is equal to psi hat of rho and D and T hat of rho and L is equal to T hat of rho and D. And so because it has to hold for this particular case, you know, this left-hand side we didn't mess with. We only messed with the omega naught term, which is independent of L. Well, because of that, it has to hold for, you know, any omega naught, regardless of whether omega naught equals minus W. Um, and so that says that these can actually only depend on the symmetric part of the velocity gradient. And so, you know, the, the dependence on the skew symmetric part is null. So what we have then is that those two constitutive response functions have to be functions only of D and not of L. And if you think back to the frame indifference section, that makes sense since we showed that L is not frame indifferent and W is not frame indifferent, but D is. And so if you wanted to come up with a constitutive law that's frame indifferent, you probably only want to use frame indifferent things as arguments for it. All right, so back to frame indifference. So we have that psi hat of rho and D is equal to psi hat of rho Q D Q transpose <laughs> and Q T hat of rho and D Q transpose is equal to T hat of rho Q D Q transpose. All right, so if we look at this, we see then that the constitutive function must be isotropic, as in have no directional preferences in its argument D. Um, and we did something very similar to this in the discussion of elastic fluids as it pertains to that. Um, actually, I guess that was the pressure part. Yeah, that was there. But then, um, you know, also this has to be a, an isotropic tensor function of D. And there's a, uh, there's a big, not big, couple pages in the appendix, um, chapter 113 of the textbook that kind of goes into more detail 
about deriving the functional form of isotropic tensor functions that map second order tensors to second order tensors. But um, basically, isotropic second order tensor functions have to be pretty darn simple. All right, so we're going to write down <coughs> this. Here we go. All right, let's define T hat vis for viscous of rho D <clears throat> as T hat of rho and D minus T hat of rho and zero. So that's called the viscous stress. All right, well, if we look at this second term here, T hat of rho and zero, Boy, zero looks a lot like capital D, doesn't it? That's uh, that'll throw you off. At any rate, that one's a D, and that one's a zero. All right, so this we're going to be talking about zero and not D here. Q T hat of rho and zero. Q transpose is equal to T <coughs> hat of rho q zero q transpose is equal to t hat of rho and zero. All right, so from this one, Q times T times Q transpose is equal to T, you know, for the, the zero one. Um, well, that shows, and we talked about this in the last lecture, that um, in that case, T of rho and zero must be a spherical tensor. So a scalar multiple of the identity. That's the only way that it can be invariant under all rotations. T hat of rho and zero is equal to, we'll call it minus P EQ for thermal equilibrium of rho. So that's only a function of rho since D doesn't appear in there. And then multiplying the identity tensor. So T hat of rho and D is equal to minus the equilibrium pressure of rho times the identity plus the viscous stress. <clears throat> 
of rho and d. <coughs> Ooh, boy, in my notes, I messed up some transpose here. Fix that. All right. So we'll go on to the new page. The viscous stress also has to be frame indifferent since you know this is frame indifferent and this is the sum of the two and it has to be so we have <clears throat> q viscous stress constitutive response function of rho and d q transpose is equal to t this Rho Q D Q transpose. All right. And so now let's look at free energy imbalance. And this is the one for a mechanical theory since we don't have the thermodynamics. So when you go to do free energy imbalance or the second law for your stuff, you'll need to use the thermal one. That'll be probably the biggest difference is that you'll just have, you know, the uh, heat stuff to deal with as well. So we have that psi dot is equal to partial psi hat of rho and d partial rho, rho dot, <laughs> plus <clears throat> partial psi hat of rho and d partial d. So that one's a second order tensor, inner product d dot. And we can write free energy imbalance then as rho psi dot. And we can plug that in. We'll write it a little smaller. All right, and then minus <clears throat> the internal work is going to be less than or equal to zero. So T hat rho internal power rather rate of work All right, let's um, put in our functional representation in terms of the pressure and the viscous stress for T hat there. <clears throat> and then, whoop, that's not D dot either. That is a, whoop, there you go. All right, T hat of rho D inner product D is equal to minus p equilibrium of rho times the identity plus t this viscous stress rho and d so that little inner product D, need to 
go put those square brackets in my notes. Missed them. All right, there we go. All right, well, if you look at the inner product of 1 and d, that's going to be the trace of d, right, because So what we have is um, t hat of rho <clears throat> and d inner product d is equal to on that second one. That's what happened. All right. Oh, and I didn't need them on the first one. I copied it a little wrong. That'll do it. All right. So now, so we have minus p hat eq of rho trace of d and then plus t this rho and d inner product d Okay, so we have, um, because rho dot is equal to minus rho div v is equal to minus rho trace d, right? The trace of the velocity gradient is equal to the trace of its symmetric part is equal to the divergence of velocity. So we have that rho rho dot is equal to minus rho squared trace d Okay, yeah, we're still good. Getting ahead of myself there. Yeah, so now what we're doing is we're going to plug this back in to the inequality. And what we end up with is we're going to take uh, this term out and make that trace of d substitution into what we had and loop that over to the row multiplied term. All right, so we have rho times partial psi hat of rho and d, partial d, 
inner product d dot plus minus rho squared partial psi hat rho and d partial rho plus p hat equilibrium of rho trace d. So <clears throat> what we did there is we took, you know, this, ooh, don't want that. We want the highlighter there. We took this part, or the laser, I guess we call it, um, as well as this part with this and used it to take this term and the thermodynamic, we'll call it, or, you know, density-based pressure and move it into this term right here. And then minus T this of rho and D inner product D is less than or equal to zero. And this is for all rho greater than zero, D and D dot, where both D and D dot are required to be symmetric, but they're independent of one another for you know reasons that we've already talked about. <clears throat> All right, so looking at this, um, that's going to require then that this term, this term, and this term satisfy the inequality all individually, since the trace of D is independent from D. You know, it's related to it, but you have pretty much the entire deviatoric part of d to play with there. Uh, d dot is independent of either of those. And d dot, we know, you know, it can, this inner product can, uh, you know, because this doesn't depend on d dot, we could make that positive or negative um, by varying what d dot is, unless this term here is zero. And likewise, the trace of d, which is the divergence of the velocity, can be any old thing. Um, and so what we end up with is that this has to be 0, this has to be 0, and this has to be less than or equal to 0. So the first partial psi hat of rho and d partial d is equal to 0. So the free energy is equal to the free energy constitutive response function, which is only a variable of the density, or only dependent on the density. Um, P hat equilibrium of the density is equal to rho squared derivative of the free energy with respect to the density that comes from making this term zero. And then we end up finally, so those are two kind of thermodynamic restrictions, and then we end up with the reduced dissipation inequality, which is that T viscous rho and D inner product D is greater than or equal to zero. <clears throat> 
All right, and this is as far as we can get until we pick a functional form for the viscous stress. Um, and now let's talk about the case where the viscous stress is a linear function of the velocity gradients symmetric part. So that'll be linearly viscous compressible fluids. So models with um, the constitutive response function T viscous of rho and D linear in D work pretty well for most normal type fluids. Um, so if you're talking about water, air, steam at normal sorts of pressures and operating conditions, and you're not going from, you know, atmospheric to a couple terapascals or something, well, even gigapascals, things get messy. But at any rate, if you're not doing ridiculous things, then the sort of stress strain rate, if you would, uh, relationship being linear, um, even if the constants in it depend on the density, that does a pretty darn good job for basically anything that isn't like goop, you know, like peanut butter or really nasty things like that. But if it's air, water, steam, even like motor oil, if you're not talking about it in a concentrated contact that's at like a gigapascal, we found that those work pretty darned well if you just model the viscous stress as a linear function of the strain rate. Now, often you want to add thermal effects in so that it can be a function of the density and the temperature. Um, but that's all right. That doesn't really complicate things all that much. So as we said before, frame indifference requires that the viscous stress be an isotropic function of the symmetric part of the velocity gradient. I suppose that's called the stretching tensor. Why'd that do that to me? be an isotropic function of D for a given, for any given density. <laughs> so the textbook provides a proof um, in fact, a representation theorem for general isotropic tensor functions of second order tensors. So they can only depend on like the, I think it was the first invariant times the, well, some, some scalar function of the first invariant times the identity plus a, uh, another scalar function of the trace times I think it was the trace times the identity. At any rate, um, then one was times A, you know, the tensor itself, and then there was a final one that multiplied A squared. Um, and if it's linear, then the A squared one goes away. And so you only end up with two terms. One is like a scalar times the trace of the original tensor times the identity, and the other is just a scalar multiple of the tensor. So you can look at chapter, well, the appendix, which is chapter 113, to see 
that proof. But basically, let's see what we want to say. Um, But a linear function we'll just call it f of s mapping a second order symmetric tensor to a symmetric tensor. So we'll just say symmetric tensors. is isotropic if and only if there are scalars mu and lambda called the LeMay parameters that are going to satisfy this. So there you go. That's the, the big trick of continuum mechanics there is you go out and you know to call those LeMay parameters and not lame parameters. I mean, if you want to, you can still call them that. But LeMay was a person. Otherwise, people would be like, ah, you never took a class on this. You only read it in a book. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, so what they're going to satisfy is f of s is equal to 2 mu of s plus lambda trace s times the identity. And so for us here, that's going to mean that t vis of rho and d can be isotropic in d only if it, if and only if it looks like this is equal to 2 mu hat, which can be a function of the density, times d plus lambda hat of rho trace d times the identity. And let's let a uh, kappa, which is called the bulk modulus. So here, mu, I guess it's called the bulk viscosity. Mu is called the dynamic or molecular viscosity. And kappa of rho is going to be defined as lambda hat of rho plus 2 thirds mu of rho called it's also called the dilatational viscosity um, and we'll show why in a second dilatation meaning if something is expanding or contracting all right so we're going to use the spherical decomposition of d which um, you needed to use on that little section of your fifth homework assignment, which is pretty much exactly what we're going to be doing here. So d minus one third trace of d times the identity plus one third trace of d times the identity. So this part here is the deviatoric part of D. And we have that the trace of D naught is equal to the trace 
D minus one third trace of D trace of the identity and the trace of the identity is three. So that is equal to the trace of D minus the trace of D is equal to zero. So the trace of the deviatoric part is zero. And then the trace of one third trace D times the identity is equal to one third trace D trace of the identity, which is three. So that is equal to the trace of D. <clears throat> so we've basically decomposed it into the traceless part and the part that only has the trace. All right, well, from here we have that D naught inner product one is equal to the trace of D naught transpose times the identity um, by the definition of that inner product. And so that is equal to the trace of D naught transpose is equal to the trace D naught, which is equal to zero. And D inner product D naught is equal to D naught plus one third trace D, oopsies, minus there. No, plus is correct. times the identity, inner product D naught, which is equal to D naught, inner product D naught, since we just showed that the part, well, this one inner product D naught is zero. Um, so that is equal to the magnitude of D naught squared. All right, so from there, we have that T this of rho and D inner product D is equal to 2 mu hat of rho d plus lambda hat of rho trace d times the identity. Inner product, Ooh, let's move this stuff. A little bit closer together, maybe. Let's get out of here. Very non COVID moving all these closer together, right? But what are you going to do? Uh oh. All right, let's finish up our non socially distant equation then. All right, and so that is equal to 2 mu hat of rho 
magnitude of d naught squared plus one third trace of d d inner product one and then plus one third of lambda and then we have the trace of d squared one inner product one so here we recognize the fact that um, you know this one here inner product this one here is zero and the first term is just this times this plus this times that all right so this is equal to two mu hat rho magnitude of d naught <coughs> squared plus two thirds mu of rho trace of d squared plus lambda hat of rho trace d squared. So we can combine the ones multiplying trace of d squared is equal to two mu rho d naught magnitude squared plus lambda plus two thirds mu trace d squared. All right, and so that is equal to 2 mu squared plus, we'll call it kappa, as we said, of rho, d dilatational or bulk viscosity, times trace squared. And so our reduced dissipation inequality is that this is greater than or equal to 0. Um, clearly, the magnitude of the deviatoric part, it's square, and the square of the trace are both independent and non-negative. So we have to have that mu hat of rho is greater than or equal to zero for all rho. And kappa of rho which is equal to lambda of rho plus two thirds mu of rho is greater than or equal to zero for all rho. So we require that lambda of rho is greater than or equal to minus two thirds mu of rho. And the Cauchy stress tensor, T, is equal to minus P EQ of rho minus kappa of rho trace D times the identity plus 2 mu hat of rho times d naught, the deviatoric part. Um, so this term here is the mechanical pressure. That's, you know, the isotropic, the, the scalar multiplying the identity for the isotropic part of the stress. 
So Stokes' hypothesis, which is often invoked, is that the mechanical pressure is equal to the thermodynamic pressure. So Stokes' hypothesis. P is equal to P EQ. So the bulk viscosity of rho is equal to zero, which gives us that um, lambda is equal to minus two thirds mu. So basically what that says is that there is no viscous loss associated or viscous friction associated with expansion and contraction, independent of you know shear, um, and that's been shown to work pretty darned well for monoatomic gases like helium and everything. Um, and usually, there is some bulk modulus for say polyatomic gases like oxygen or um, liquids, but you know, for aerospace -y sorts of things, Stokes' hypothesis, it does a pretty decent job. Um, and otherwise, you need to model what lambda is. All right, that's all we have. Um, hope the final homework assignment doesn't take you too long. It should follow pretty directly from this. Um, adding in the thermal stuff shouldn't be too bad. And, you know, feel free to get in touch with me if you need to have a little extra time on it. Or if you have any questions, I'm happy to meet you with online office hours. Um, I think I'll have to turn in the grades by Sunday night. So, you know, if you need a little extra time, we can get it to me sometime on Saturday or maybe even early Sunday. Although sometimes Saturday would certainly be better. All right. Have a good one. Bye.